This episode of the Ministry of Misfits podcast and this awesome shirt are brought to you by a Courageous Clothing Company. Courageous Clothing Company is a Christian family-owned business that specializes in custom designs that they create as well as bulk screen printing of your custom designs as well. When you buy from Courageous Clothing Company, you're not just buying an awesome shirt, you also are helping spread the gospel across the world through the missions that they support, such as this here with Ministry Misfits, as well as with their own designs that have Christian themed messages sharing the gospel in an awesome and relevant way or as we say within CSRM and Mr. Misfits, strategically relevant evangelism. Check out their entire line at CourageousClothingCompany.com. The following was recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic through Zoom meetings in accordance with local health guidelines. My father was a pastor before I was born and during my adolescence. Um, I was made to go to church just like any other child would have to do if they, if their father was a pastor. Um, I went because it was, I could hang out with my friends and have fun, but it was more about that than what was really going on with the word. And I, as I got older, I went less and less and frequently went in there, but not all the time. And uh, then when I hit high school, I was starting to party and uh, thinking I wanted to be a musician and musicians party. So that's what I was doing. And um, yeah, so I, I had a lot of arguments with people about God and uh, questioning my faith in God. And uh, still to this day, I still, I mean, Israel means to struggle with God. And I struggle with God for sure. And uh, some days I wonder if there's a God and some days I know for sure there's a God. But it didn't matter if my dad was a pastor or not. I had to, on my own, figure out what what God really meant to me. And uh, there's no one that can talk you into that. Hi, welcome to another Ministry Misfits podcast. I am the Ministry Misfit, Andrew Fouts. This is episode number six, I believe. We're already up high enough that I've lost count, which is not a good sign. Um, but today with me, I have Elijah Mendiola, um, who is joining us, which I actually just realized, I know you're in the central time zone, but I don't actually know where you're at. I am in Corpus Christi, Texas. Texas. There we go. Real close. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Elijah joining us, um, from Corpus Christi. And today we're going to look at, um, a topic that may be a little bit more personal, a little bit more difficult to hear for some people. It may be more encouraging for some, um, but still we fear this was a good, good topic to discuss when we're on this topic of what it looks like to be a minister that is in ministry, whether that's in a church or a para ministry, whatever that is, we, we want to make sure that this is something that gets discussed and that is what to do with your children. Um, you know, we, the, we, there's a lot of stories um, of famous pastors, especially that their kids have slid away from the faith completely. You have some very famous atheists who dad, whose dad is a famous pastor. A lot of this dynamic, and oftentimes we hear of these stories and we think, oh, well, the parents have failed. If, you know, how can they reach their, their church if they can't reach their family? Um, you know, a lot of that comes from the understanding of what we see in Corinthians, where Paul gives the descriptions of if you can't manage your house, you can't manage the church. But there's a much bigger piece to all of this. And that's what we want to unpack today. And that's about the whole idea of whether or not the parent is responsible for the salvation of their children. 
um, and especially what that means and what that looks like for those of us that have children and are in ministry. So Elijah, welcome to the Ministry Misfits podcast and uh, looking forward to seeing what, what we can discuss today. Um, well, thanks for having me, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you you kind of gave us a little bit of a brief, those of you that actually listened through the intro and said, just skipping ahead, um, you you shared a little bit about the fact that, you you know, you were a PK growing up. Um, you know, dad was a pastor. Um, you, though, wanted to go into into music. Um, what do you play, by the way? Yep. I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I play drums, bass, vocals, and guitar. Uh, my main focus is guitar, but I can shred on all, nice. <laughs> all fronts. So my main <laughs> thing was guitar. And uh, as when my band fell apart, I was like, well, I guess I need to learn the drums too. So I, then I started picking <laughs> up the drums, and now I have full-blown songs that I just make by myself. Nice. And, I may, uh, I've uh, played in I, – yeah, I – I may, I may have a uh, teenage kid that I've been talking to that I may want to connect you with. He's trying to get kind of his own production thing going as well. But that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother podcast. Yeah, that's a whole nother can of worms, man. Yeah. Uh, I spent years trying to figure out how to just get it on the computer. Yeah. Because I would, I would record with an old tape deck and I would just hit record and record on a, a cassette tape and then put a second cassette tape in there and try to record over that. But that was like early two thousands, and now it's all digital, and it's you, way you were easier. still you were still using cassette tapes in the early two thousands. That that alone is worthy of its own podcast <laughs> episode. Um, but yeah, I so I just, you uh, you shared that you uh, you know you were a PK growing up, um, went, yep. wanted to go to music, and so this is where, in a lot of ways this is where a lot of the stories of, you know, what was being referred to now as deconstructed Christian start of where you wanted to go one route, your parents were wanting you to go another, or at least your parents' church may have been wanting you to go another. Um, but give us a little bit of insight in that. What, what kind of, what was the reaction from, you know, your parents, from your parents' congregation, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. What was the reaction when you started moving more away from the church? Um, and, you know, what what did that, what, what kind of stuff happened there? What did that look like for you? Well, my dad, he was a uh, minister, but he also had to work full-time in the oil field. So um, he wasn't able to keep close tabs on us even even if you tried because i don't know if you know but the oil field you usually work 10 plus hours a day mm -hmm. pretty much every single day and uh we got to the age where uh we started hanging out with people that were drinking already and so um i started drinking probably at the age of 14 and smoking pot if i can say that i mm -hmm. mean just full cannon and um, at first, my dad, we'd hide it from my dad. So he didn't know really what was going on. But uh, yeah, that's what we were doing. And uh, we, we, it was all about the music. And we were just like, man, uh, we should, we want to be rock stars. We want to start a band. Uh, at the back of my mind, I was still a Christian, but. I always felt that Christianity was like one of those things where you could say, okay, I accept God. I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I can sin. I can do whatever I want. Cause in a way, in a way it's, it is true. But at the same time, you, um, once you accept the Lord, you don't want to be doing those crazy things, you know, just for some conviction uh, there. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. the conviction. And then, and then, uh, you stay up all night partying and then my mom asked me to go to church and then I go to church and I'm just like sitting in church. Like, Oh man, this is crazy. Cause like I'm on drugs and I'm sitting in church right now. And, um, it's just, I don't know. It, it feels like, uh, there, I was living two separate lives, you know, like one life I was trying to be this musician which I thought was going to happen no matter what. And uh, it ended up not happening. I mean, I'm still a musician, but it, it, I didn't 
start making serious money and and most people don't and um but that was hard to accept and I, I still haven't fully accepted it as I'm still making music but I kind of already know that it's just not going to happen and um but the thing is uh I would always get drunk and um talk to my friends like like uh try to preach to them drunk and they're like dude yeah you're, <laughs> you're drunk and you're trying to tell me that i'm supposed to be a better person and believe in christ and stuff and i'm like i like i'm like i know but uh um that has nothing to do with it and and it goes back to one of those things where it's like well practice what you preach or or it gives that bad look you know that uh oh, this dude's supposed to be a preacher's son and he's getting drunk. So that kind of gives a bad vibe to someone that's potentially wanting to listen to me, but he gets that, you know, like, hey, uh, this dude's no better than me. He's getting drunk and high and he's trying to tell me about the Lord. So it, it um, and that happened a lot. And uh, I just, eventually I just kind of, uh, well, now I'm nine years sober. Nice. I haven't even had a beer. Yeah, I haven't even had a beer in nine years. And uh, a lot of my friends still drink. And it's just, they call me boring now. And they're like, dude, you were crazy. You'd probably be dead right now if you kept drinking. And I'm like, yeah, I probably would have been because I was the, the wild one. But back to uh, the Christian thing, my dad, he 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 didn't like it. He... um. He wanted us to love God and go to church and do all these things. And and, and then we did because I have a brother and two sisters and we did love God, but we, uh, we just did our own thing and he tried to keep us in the church, but, uh, and we did go to church, but it's still, you know, that, that didn't stop us from wanting to party. And I feel that, um, that uh i don't know like it, it didn't stop us we just wanted to keep doing our thing and it, and and, and it, you should know that uh christianity is not really like um it's not really a religion there's no um like rituals you have to do and it's more like the the lax um uh beliefs of all of them as far as um having to do this or that it's more like uh jesus died on your on the cross for your sins and uh if you accept that then you're you're washing the blood of the lamb and you're free to do whatever you want but like i was saying it, it's true but it's also that's like a double-edged sword like you don't want to just think oh i'm a christian i can do whatever i want you know yeah you know that that we've got a couple of things we can unpack there you know one one thing um real quick i think because this is something that's becoming way more common you talked about your dad was, you know, he was a full-time preacher, but he also was basically full-time in the oil field as well. Um, you know, this, the bivocational aspect of ministry is something that is becoming, I think, I think in American context, it really has always been there. Um, you know, even going back to like, you know, the little house on the prairie type things where, yeah, everybody recognized this guy was the reverend, but the town wasn't paying him enough to live on. He was, I'm sure, you know, there were other things that right. had to be going on. Um, this is something that becomes very common, especially now uh, during the middle of COVID. There's a lot of pastors that have had to kind of split off into doing the, the bivocational stuff, even if they hadn't before. Um, you know, th this is, this is something that unfortunately is, is a common thing. And part of what you were saying is part of the big struggle is that how do you divide your time between being in the church, being at the job that's actually paying you and being, being dad and being leader in the family. And it's a very hard thing to juggle. It's a very hard thing to do. And honestly, I don't know that there really are any magic formulas on how to do it, but you know, one, one of the big things that we always talk about here at CSRM is that your family is your first ministry. Um, you know, your, your family is the first ministry. Your family takes precedence over the church. It takes precedence over the other job. It's the first ministry. 
you've got to balance this stuff. Um, you know, Dr. Linville talks about the fact, you know, his kids and his wife had told him early on that, you know, every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to another. Um, and the, these are the things we've got to juggle, but for you as the, as the son, did, did you see that kind of, you know, your dad have that kind of struggle internally as far as how do I manage all of these hats? Was it something that, you know, you, you recognized, you know, as a kid, or was this something that, you know, you maybe it took you being an adult to, to finally see it fully? Oh, uh, definitely. He, he, uh, like, I mean, I didn't really, I didn't really understand how it felt until I got my age now. And I have stepchildren and, and uh, I want them to go to church and I want my stepson to be playing guitar 24 seven, but he likes hip hop. And I'm just like, dude, I have guitars and I have drums. I have everything here. Just please play it. And he doesn't want to. And that's when I realized, like, oh, I don't have full control over anybody. And no one had full control over me. And so my dad, uh, he tried, but, man, he had he had my stepmom. And then she had three kids. And it was, there was four of us. So there were seven of, seven of us in the house, plus his wife, plus a full-time job plus trying to teach and I I don't even know how he got close to managing us and um, (laughs) by by no fault of his own um, we just ended up being wild childs and uh, um, it got dark Uh, it got really dark and um, I mean there's light at the end of the tunnel but um, (sighs) my brother passed away from heroin Mm. about three years ago. Uh, And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to think about what my dad has to go through. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, and, and, you know, this is part of like, like we said, this is part of why we're wanting to kind of talk about this in this kind of a format with the ministry misfit side of things is, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, as, as emotional as you are right now, thinking of it, your you know, your parents have the same, you know, emotional response to it as well, I'm sure. And th- this is one of those things where it's very hard sometimes for us to be able to separate out you know, did we, if I had not spent so much time as at the church, would this have been an issue? If I had forced them even harder with this, if I hadn't forced them, a lot of these second guessings, a lot of these, how do we actually manage this? Yeah, there is and, and, no and my real brother way. Was, yeah, go ahead. No, there's not. My brother was into the word more than I was. Uh, he read the Bible several times. Um, he knew the word and my dad thought he was going to be the preacher and he told us that. And, uh, my brother, but my brother was, um, he was real shy when he was a kid. And, uh, he was one of those guys that he was real insecure. And he felt like if he didn't do what everybody else was doing, he felt like they were going to leave him out of it or he wasn't going to be accepted into the group. So he did what everyone else was doing. And it was just one of those things where you hang out with it's birds of a feather. You know, you hang out with bad people. They get you to, uh, you do bad things to fit in. And then those people go away and you're stuck with your addiction, you know? Yeah. And, And, uh, my, my, no, go go ahead. ahead. No, you go, go. Okay. Keep going. And my, and my dad tried his best to help my brother. Uh, all of us did. But like I said, it all comes down to the individual and what that person does. Um, heroin is a, uh, it will kill you. Um, it had, and nowadays it's laced with fentanyl, which will mm-hmm. kill you instantly. And uh, I honestly think that's probably what happened to him. Uh, he wasn't, um, he, he was, he was in a better place. He was doing better 
when this happened and everyone nobody saw it coming because she was doing better yeah and uh it just i think maybe he got something crazy from mexico that fit and all crap and uh it just took him and uh it was hard and that that story alone is one that I'm sure anybody listening has some kind of being able to relate. Maybe it's not a family member, but you know, the heroin epidemic is something that's growing increasingly more and more. Um, you know, it's overtaken some of the other drugs that used to be at the the top of the list, especially for overdoses. But, and, and this is just, you know, this is a side note. This isn't even what we were, we're on here to talk about, but this is something where, you know, churches, this is a perfect place for you to be able to get involved um in your communities is that you know the drug epidemic is is real it is massive it does you know it it takes lives you know there there are ways for you as a church to be able to minister to this um you know there there are different different groups that you can host um they don't even have to necessarily be bible based but if they're helping um i know the church that my wife and i were at before we we ended up in cleveland and canton was doing they were hosting the local narcotics anonymous group um you know there was no questions asked mm -hmm. no no expectations we put out the coffee and the soda for them and we just let them meet and it it had a major impact on the way that the community viewed the pastor and the staff there at the church as far as you know they actually will let us come in regardless of what we had done over the weekend um, you know, so that that's a whole yeah. nother topic and, you know, one that maybe we'll cover cover later on. But, um, you know, back, back yeah, to I'd you. like to talk about that, too. Yeah. Back to you, back to your your story where, where you're at here. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, your dad was was a pastor. He was also bivocational. He also had a very large family. Mm -hmm. And, th you know, yeah. this is a very common common uh the math word that I can't think of now, um, common, common, you know, problem that we see common, common denominators, all those sort of things where we have a lot of these kind of situations going on in, in our churches, whether it's the senior pastor or the music minister or the sports minister or whatever. Yeah. There are a lot of these different things. And especially those of us within the sports minister world, where normally if we are full-time at the church, we're wearing three or four different hats if we aren't full-time at the church, that means mm -hmm. we are working other jobs. This becomes very chaotic. Yeah. The important thing, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the thing that is important for you to remember is the fact that your kids know. Your kids see the fact that you, you know, you're struggling with this. You do not have to put as much pressure on yourself as you probably feel like you need to. You know, you as the, as the parent, just need to focus in on being the parent. Um, you know, yes, your first ministry is to your children and your family, but um, our pastor that, you know, we, we go to Third Street Community Church at the moment, you know, Corey today, one of the things that he said that he got from one of his, his mentors is that you want to be famous in your own house. Um, you know, at the end yep. of the day, it doesn't matter what the community thinks. If your family is there supporting you and your family sees you and you're honest with your family, that is going to have more kingdom impact than the things that you're doing, doing elsewhere. And it just because you're doing that though, does not mean that you're going to get the results that everybody thinks you need to. And that kind of picks back up with where we're at in your story. So you, uh, you know, you, and it sounds like the, your, your, some of your other siblings also, you know, kind of had moved away from the church a little bit. Um, you were more in the music scene. Um, you know, there were a couple couple of drug alcohol things which praise god you're sober now congratulations mm -hmm. on nine years because that's a oh, major yeah. major accomplishment in, it, in and of itself mm -hmm. um but walk us through a little bit you you started talking about um with your brother and you know that there were some very dark periods that were coming up um you know get you don't have obviously only share what you feel like sharing you don't yeah, need yeah, to sure. share anything too yeah. deep or too too hurtful or anything like that but yeah Give us give us a little bit of insight as to this process because right now this sounds like a very sad, depressing story. But ultimately, that's not actually it, what it we're is. here to talk talk about. Is that it wasn't yeah that sad, sad process, depressing process. But the story itself 
is, is actually not that well, that sad of a story. So give us a little bit of insight of where, where we're at so far in your story. Well, God said that we are going to struggle. Uh, it's not going to be roses and rainbows, you know. Um, we don't have to suffer, but again, God gives us free will. So we have to do whatever that, uh, whatever we feel like we have to do. And um, when I was younger, I would, I would party a lot. And uh, I just felt like it was, it was a dark time because I was doing okay. But in the back of my mind, I was like, I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to do drugs, but I just kept doing them. Uh, and, uh, sometimes it was fun. And sometimes I got thrown in jail or got in a fight. And those are the nights when I really look and say, okay, I need to weigh the pros and the cons. I need to see what is uh, more important and where my life's going to go. And it wasn't me talking to myself. I was basically talking to God, asking him, what do I do? Uh, you know, I want to quit. I'm trying to quit. Um, is it possible to quit when you, everyone, you know, drinks and does drugs. And, uh, eventually I just felt like, uh, I just, one day, I, I don't even know why or how I just said, okay, because I, I consider myself a, a, um, a mentally strong person. And uh, that's in and itself is a major, major problem. Yeah. If you ask me as far as people uh, controlling their lives, because you can tell when someone's mentally weak, and, and I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but uh, some people just don't have a strong will. And I don't know if it's uh well i know it's god but if fully it has to be on yourself also to be able to be mentally strong and i've always i, I was always that kind of guy that I, I wanted to be the best at everything so i try to be the best skateboarder because i skateboarded for like 15 years until i tore my acl i wanted to be the best guitar player i wanted to be the best drummer i, I just wanted to be the best and and that's just my competitive nature and then i, I was like well if i'm gonna quit drinking I'm going to be the best at it. I'm going to hundred percent cold Turkey, no AA meetings, uh, no pills, no doctors, no, no nothing. I'm today's the day it's done. And I said, I know that, uh, that, um, that God can help me break those chains. And I wanted to prove that it can happen. And I wanted to prove that you don't need, um, AA or uh drug programs or or uh psychiatrists or anything i just wanted to prove to myself and to everyone i know that you don't have to you can just quit it doesn't matter you have the willpower uh god says he'll break the chains of addiction and uh i wanted to prove to myself that that was true and so i just started counting day one day two day three day four all the way I get to the week. Okay. Okay. Seven days. It's one week. And then I go, okay, boom. I hit two weeks. And then people would ask me, you want to go drink? Let's go drink, dude. I'm like, nah, man, uh, I'm not going to drink. And, uh, and so I just kept doing that. And then clo when I got to like 30 weeks, I was like, wow, I'm almost to a year. And so I was like, I'm just going to keep going to a year. And then I hit a year and then I was like, man, this is crazy. Uh, my problems went out the window. Uh, I started having more money. My days were weren't as counter it as counterproductive. People were still looking at me like, "Dude, you were the hardest drinker out of all of us." Uh, what's going on? Like, don't you want to go hang out and drink? And I'm like, "No, uh, I I don't, man." And and sometimes like I would go hang out with my friends, and they'd offer me beer, and I'm, I just wouldn't do it. And at the end, and then, and then the next day, when they wake up feeling like crap, and uh, or end up in jail or anything stupid, I woke up feeling great, and that was one of the things where I, I proved to myself and to my friends. They asked me, "How'd you do it?" I just said, 
the Lord broke my chains of addiction. And I still say that. And it feels it feels empowering to say that. And it and it's real. And and I prove that it's real. And I was never addicted on heroin or um any hard drug. Well, I did do some hard drugs, but I think that it doesn't matter what it is, you can quit with the Lord and your own uh willpower to stop. And so um but and when all this was going on, I was struggling with God. I would I was questioning God. I was saying, Why am I supposed to be a Christian, but I'm addicted to drugs? Uh why, you know, just all those type of deals. And uh eventually I just begged God to help me and uh I feel like he did. Yeah, this is um you know, there, there's a couple of different theological things we can, you know, pull out of just that section alone. Um, you know, the one, one thing, though, that I, I I hear out of your story and we hear a lot of times is this thing is that realistically, the, the thing that you were struggling with most was an identity crisis of sorts. Um, you know, you you had been you know, you were raised the the son of a pastor, but that wanted to be a musician. Um, sounds like you were wanting to do some skateboarding as well. And then the knee goes out, um, you know, yeah. you, you've lost a family member to, to drugs. You, uh, you know, you yourself have, you know, gotten hooked, hooked in with alcohol. Um, and the, but the, the big thing that you started wrestling with is if I'm supposedly a Christian, why does this stuff keep happening? Um, and th this yeah, is it, one of it those. Was, uh, it... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it was a, it was a, it was like literally a, a wrestling match with God. Like I would just be like, just screaming, like, what is going on? You know, like, just, I don't know. It's crazy. And it, it was a back and forth. It was like, uh, okay. I, I, I know I want to quit. And that's the problem. Most people don't want to quit. Um, or they say, Oh, I'll just drink on the weekends or, uh, I'll just have a couple of beers. I, I can handle it. I'll just drink a couple of beers. But like I was saying, I wanted to be the best at everything. I wanted to be the best drinker, as stupid as that sounds. Like everyone was drinking. I was, I'll drink 10 beers before you drink two. And uh, that that was just my nature. And um, I guess one day it went into the in the positive way. And I went full-blown, no nothing. And I'm better for it, 100%. And that's that's part of where, um, you know, we and we can get into this more on another episode even, you know, we – we don't want to shy away from the fact there are some people that, you know, it, it is going to take a little bit more than just the willpower and the prayer because, you know, there's other things, especially with things like you were talking about with the heroin, um, things like that, where, yeah. you know, there's there's much more. So we are not saying do not seek help and do not seek accountability, but God is going to be able yeah, to, I mean, to drive it. And especially in like what you were saying there, where a lot of this boiled down to you were trying to figure out where you fit, which is part of the whole point of this podcast from a ministry perspective. But for you, in your case, you're, you know, you're, you're the product of a ministry being the son of a pastor and yet trying to figure out where you fit because you're, you know, your, your current actions were here. The actions you wanted to do were over here. And there's this divide between, you know, we use the, the term paradigm in a lot of stuff we use within, within CSRM, but it's how, how do I get from here to here and do it in the proper way? And that's part of what you're talking about. You know, it, it's very similar to what we see in, in Genesis with, with Jacob before he's about to meet Esau again. And literally he sits there and wrestles with God for an entire night because he like you're saying the the mental especially those of us that are a little bit more strong-willed mentally it's going to take a lot for us to get to the point of a humble repentance before god and saying okay god what are you at show me how you're going to use me in your case it was a meet you know a almost immediate effect of you were able to just drop the stuff you you didn't have to touch it anymore yeah. you didn't you didn't want it um and you know we're very thankful for for that and i'm sure your family is even more thankful for that um walk <laughs> walk us through walk us through a little bit more so you've you've started this process where you realize that you know you've 
you've been wrestling with God throughout this whole thing. Do you feel like this was just a, oh, For I sure. hit my breaking point and now I'm wrestling? Or has this always kind of been there? No, it, it started way early. Like like I said, I I, uh, I started drinking at 14. And uh, when I first started drinking, it was whatever. We were having fun, you know. But, but it just stops being fun you know, when you get into the real world and you get out of high school and you're like, uh Oh, well, uh, this is the real world. I, I have to start paying bills and I, I need to, you know, be Adulting. a man <laughs> and some, yeah, <laughs> some people never hit that, you know, and, and, uh, I, I realized it and, um, I tried to look at my future and, uh, I was, like I said, I was trying to weigh the pros and the cons. Um, I was always, cause my dad, he, he is sober too. Um, he's a hundred percent sober and, and he did that and he's been a hundred percent sober for a very long time. And that always weighed on me like, dang, my dad, he doesn't even drink. Like, cause most dads, I mean, even if Christian dads, they drink, you know, they have a beer here and there. And I don't even think there's really nothing wrong with that. But um, I always was, I always looked up to my dad and I was like, man, my dad is uh, very strong willed also. And I kind of, I looked up to him for that. And uh, a lot of people use their parents as like the God figure. Um, uh, biologically, they look to their parents um, for uh, mentorship and to see that, man, my dad is uh, pastor and, uh, he's hundred percent sober. And I was, I don't know. I don't even think, I'm not sure if that, cause I don't, I don't think that's what made me get sober because I don't think that's how it works. You know, it's, it's down to the individual and I just by, by the grace of God, I was just able to kick it. And, uh, I, I'm not even, I want to say I won't drink for the rest of my life. Cause you know, I just feels good. Uh, I, I, I have so many hobbies. I, I started the podcasting. Uh, I've been playing, I play tons of music. I'm a carpenter. I have a full-time job and I just feel like I don't even have time for that no more, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I still talk to my dad every day or oh, not every day. He gets mad cause I don't call him all the time, but, uh, he, <laughs> I like his still- dad. <laughs> <There you laughs> <go>. Hey dad, <laughs> I'm sure you'll see this. But uh, he's still a, he's still a minister. He does the uh, he does the morning uh, ministries at a small church here in town, Corpus, called uh, South Crest Baptist. And I, I went to that church my whole life. Like even when I was a little kid, I went to that church, and it's and, and I still go to that church. Um, now there's pretty much no youth there. It's mainly like older people. But I always thought the pastor was a great pastor, uh, brother Buddy, and he's one of the, he's actually one of the longest running pastors in Texas. Yeah, he's been uh, preaching for I think almost seventy years. Oh my, yeah, yeah. He he has like I think he, he has a record. He's been around a few times. Yeah, <laughs> he has a record like that dude, and, and he's a really good pastor. And so is my dad. My dad blows my mind daily. He uh, blew my mind yesterday. Cause I had my cousin on, um, I had my cousin on yesterday on my podcast and he was telling me a lot of things and I was questioning him about, cause he was telling me about eternal sleep or not eternal sleep, but uh, after you die, you sleep until the resurrection. And I was like, I don't think I agree with that. Uh, uh, cause we're both Christians, but you know how some people, they have different. Yeah interpretations of how things are going to go and i was telling him i'm like i don't agree with that and then i and then but i was almost swayed i almost was like well maybe i don't don't know um and then i talked to my dad and he's like uh no you you when you die to be abs to be absent from life is uh to be present with the lord and it's instant and i was like yeah that sounds about right and uh, my dad is, is very smart when it comes to the word. And he's and I feel like uh, everyone is trying to interpret the Bible a certain way. And uh, I feel like my dad just nails it on the head 
like big time. Like I'm always blown away with his uh, insight on the Bible. And this and, really uh, is. So uh, yeah, he. Yeah, th- this really is down to the heart of what you know we want people to to see as an encouragement. Um, you know, you, it's not always going to turn out this way. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of stories of, you know, kids of, of ministers that they deviate for a while and then they, they just continue to deviate and they do never come back. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, there, you, you're a perfect example, the proverb above, you know, train up a child in the way they should go. And then, you know, as they grow up, they will not depart. You know, you were trained up in this, you still went away, but even as you were going further and further away, there was still this nagging calling back. Definitely. Um, you know, and, and I that, think that has go. Yeah, go for it. There must be a delay. I think I mean, we've got a little I bit think, of a delay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, you're and good. I think that has to do with, yeah, I think that has to do with me actually accepting Christ at a very young age. And I, I felt that felt very real to me, uh, accepting Christ. At a, at a young age and uh, i think that's what was always pulling me like a rope like he had a rope around me and like i would try to pull away and he just keep pulling me you know and so that's how it felt and, and that's that's really what um and and like you said what what really has narrowed this down for you though is that you know this this is not your dad's faith this is your, you know, this is Elijah's right. faith. This is not your dad's faith. And that really is the the big theological framework that we're, we're trying to kind of deal with the, the philosophical framework we're dealing with here with this topic is, you know, your responsibility as the parent is not to convert your children. Your responsibility of, as the right. parent is to train them up to, you know, get them, get them get them in the word if possible, but at least get them to people that are going to be able to, to help train them up, talk to them about, you know, talk to them about their faith, ask them, you know, this is one thing that, you know, we we've talked about in a youth ministry setting more so than in a sports ministry or any other kind of pastoral setting. But even if you as the pastor are the parent and your kids ask you a theological question and you do not know the answer, it's better to say, I have no idea. Let's look at this together than it is to try to talk through, to try to just talk above or try to just give an opinion or whatever it is. If you don't know the answer, be honest with it. Be honest with your kids. Walk, walk this faith journey with them, but understand that in, in the long run, it is going to be up to your children to actually make this commitment for themselves. And if they do actually make this commitment, then really that takes a lot of pressure off of us because at that point it's not it we we did our job if they've made the commitment then they've made the commitment you know we we get to enjoy the fellowship if they haven't made the commitment then that just means we just have to keep praying and continue to be the parent um you know that that's one thing Mm -hmm. that you know you never explicitly said but it's very clear from your story even during all of this dad never stopped being dad Um, you know, there wasn't a, you know, there, there was no, well, you're, you're off doing this. So you are no longer my son. It was, he's, he is your dad first. You know, you, when you're talking about him, even now where he's a pastor at the church you attend, you refer to him as your dad. You don't refer to him as your pastor. And that is the relationship that ultimately makes the biggest difference in the long run is if you can be parent rather than having to be pastor all the time your your kids are going to sort through this themselves it may not be pretty it may not be a way that we like to watch it may be heartbreaking to watch um there may be some heartbreak when it doesn't turn out the way that you would have liked you would have hoped but that's not up to you that's up to that's up to them that's up to to god and how you know the the word we've been using a lot is how how they personally are going to wrestle with it um, so right, we're, we're about to close up here. Um, thanks for coming on. Elijah. What is your podcast? Um, just throw that out there. So if people want to hear more from you, they can, um, give, give us some, uh, contact information, things like that. Okay. Um, uh, my podcast is called lizard news network. And, uh, <laughs> I love that. I'm sorry. I just love that. And so I just wanted to say, I, I know we're running out of time here, but I, I wanted to say that I, I still wrestle with God. 
because I, I'm huge into science and, and science proves the Lord to me for sure. The deeper I go into science, the more complex, the more um, the more he reveals himself to even atheists when they mm-hmm. when they look at a, a, a protein and how the numbers are astronomical for it to have formed by chance. And I think a lot of people that are maybe uh, people that are actually struggling to even know if there is a God or not, maybe they need to look into microbiology because that will completely blow your mind. And uh, in space and all that stuff, just like I said, the heavens and the earth profess that I'm God. And that's the proof. And you say, I don't see God. Where's God? Where's he at? He's right here, dude. Look in the sky. Look at the clouds. Look at the uh, the the life on the on the earth. Look oxygen, uh, the distance from the sun, the size of the sun, uh, the size of the earth. Everything is perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a great video called "The Privileged Earth," and it explains all that. But um, I, I I still struggle, and I still listen to other people. I'll talk to an atheist. I'll talk to a Buddhist. I'll talk to anybody i i, I want to hear everybody's side of view you know and that way i can even tell them well I actually i'm a christian and i think the lord is is the one the one true god and and uh he is the one he's the way the truth and life and um i think it, that's that's also a good thing so don't close yourself off to other people that have other other beliefs you know now, i said we were done with questions but i do have one more for you that you say that do you, <laughs> do you think that if you had not dealt with all of this the struggle the you know the tech the common terms you know the backsliding you know whatever you want to call it do you think you would be able to have these kind of contacts this kind of and you know we we're big on this here i mean overwhelming victory radio we're big on this here of the podcast stuff is a ministry in itself do you think you would actually be able to be in this position if you had not dealt with that I don't know. Maybe all this stuff that happened to me uh, strengthened me in the Lord and and basically forced me to uh, love God. Because if I if my life was honky dory and everything went perfect, I probably wouldn't need God. It, it, in my mind, I wouldn't need God. And I think that's actually a lot of uh, uh, problems for people, like you were saying, like rich kids. Uh, uh, celebrities they don't what do they need god for they have all the money in the world they have fame they don't have time for god you know and uh that i think that's just a horrible way of looking at it and um yeah you, you're that's a good question you could be right about that uh, i know i can't i mean unless there's parallel universes and uh, you know that's a whole other story but uh that's i i so <laughs> I'm a so, Stargate like I was fan. Saying, I, I'm a Stargate fan, so I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. So where uh where can they find your podcast real quick before we close out? Cool. Uh um it's Lizard News Network. You can find it on Spotify and iTunes. Uh my email is L N N1984 at yahoo.com uh you can email me if you want to be a guest or you have any cool topics you want to talk talk about um i'm open to all sorts of topics like um, parallel universes and yeah <laughs> everything man dimensions flat earth i i, I don't believe i don't believe it but i'll listen to you talk about it yeah. and i'll give Which, you my uh, opinion you know yeah so thank thanks for coming on i'm not sure if this will air before or after but um on the topic you just said um be on the lookout. Uh, this is both a announcement as a cool thing to be on the watch for, as well as um, a prayer request. If this is before, if this airs before we have the interview, um, I have been invited on to a uh, "What's in the Bible," which is an atheist uh, podcast show, and we're going to be discussing some different things. Um, we're going to start out talking, you know, what's the deal with the evangelical church and Christian nationalism. Um, and then we're going to move from that into uh, who knows where he, he wants to go with it. So that's a prayer request, but also a, a shout out to say, be on the lookout because we'll let you know when when that comes up. So, Elijah, thanks for being on. Um, everybody else, we will see you next time.
The Ministry Misfits Podcast is a production of Overwhelming Victory Flicks, Overwhelming Victory Radio, and Ministry Misfit Media. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers. Our theme music is entitled Rain and provided by Morning Light Music. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. For more information on CSRM, visit csrm.org. If you are interested in listening to our sister podcast on the Overwhelming Victory Radio Network, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV Radio. If you're interested in contacting Ministry Misfit Media or have your own story to share, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Ministry Misfit or email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com.